All right, good job, good job. Take your Bible and go back, if you will, and look at uh, Matthew chapter 2. Now, this morning what I did is I preached the message from Matthew chapter 2, and we studied uh, verses 1 through 9 as we spoke on uh, the wise men's wisdom, the wise men's wisdom. Now, tonight we're going to continue in the same chapter, and we're going to speak on... Uh, the making of a Christmas Scrooge. Now, what is it that causes some people just to kind of be dumpy uh, during the Christmas time? Why is it that some are just kind of, you know, just not happy? I mean, is that just because of the Christmas time? What, what is it that maybe we could study tonight that could help us to understand how not to be. Well, let's go back in our Bible. Look at, uh, we'll pick up where we left off this morning, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 2. I preached again, verses 1 through 9. Now we're going to look at verse 10. The Bible says, and they saw a star. The Bible says, and when they saw the star, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And so they knew, and of course, as I spoke on this morning, they knew how to follow the Lord. They knew what God had placed before them. Uh, they were not impatient with it. They just followed in tow the way they were supposed to. Verse 11, the Bible says, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. The Bible says, and when they had opened up their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And what I did is I described each one of those and why they were so significantly important and what each one of those represented and why those three gifts only were given. I said, however, that there has been much discrepancy uh, that has been over these wise men, such as where they came from. Uh, there was a belief by some that these had come from Arabia. Others believed that they came from Babylon. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, being Babylonian, they thought. But uh, most, of the, most of the ones that are Bible students believe that they had come from Persia. Uh, there was a belief that, uh, that many, many, many years ago, there was a belief that there was uh, anywhere between 12, 14, or maybe even more of these wise men. Over the years, I think people have narrowed it down, as I said this morning, to three, maybe to coincide with the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, you know, maybe that. I don't know. But I think a lot of people today, uh, even as you see out in the public arena, uh, people have always looked at it as being three. Uh, you never see, uh, even in that which is the display of Christ in the manger, you never see Christ in the manger and Mary, his mother, and Joseph standing by and about 40 wise men. You just never see it, you know. Uh, you, do, you do see about three, all right? And I do think that they, what they did is they, comparatively speaking, think, you know, okay, uh, they're, they're going to gold, frankincense, and myrrh, so must be three of them, and so uh, they simply narrowed it down. Now, if you get to heaven and you find out there was 108 of them, uh, you know, then send us back a message or something, I don't know. Uh, but Matthew chapter 2 and in verse 12, the Bible says, "...in being warned of God in a dream, the Bible says, that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way." Why? Why would they be warned by God? Why would God give them such a warning? Now, can I tell you, many different people view the Christmas season differently. Uh, you know, as, as, as a counselor, I talk to people all the time, and some, they're happy about Christmas. They're overjoyed about Christmas. Some people, they're under a tremendous amount of stress during the Christmas time because they feel like they have to buy the perfect gift for the unperfect person and they're having trouble matching, you know, or they want to buy that special thing for that special person and they're having trouble matching. Or uh, maybe it's just the stress of a, a, a low budget with a high desire. I'm not really sure, but their stress, needless to say, involved with the gifts and giving of the gifts. So some people go through that. Some people have difficult times with Christmas because it was a time when they remembered mom and dad sitting around a fireplace or sitting in a living room and it was a happy time as somebody pulled out the guitar and they would begin to sing Christmas songs or maybe they would go into a piano room and uh, they, I know with us, you know, uh, we, uh, most of our children play piano, you know, and so we'll go into a piano room during the Christmas day and we'll gather around. It's almost like a tradition now and uh, we'll sing Christmas songs and things of that. 
that nature. And so it's just kind of something that the Wells family just kind of drifts that way after we eat and, uh, and start to sing and stuff like that. And I'm sure pre- uh, all the neighbors appreciate it so very, very much. But, uh, but, you know, people have different traditions. People have different things that they do during the Christmas time. And so people react differently. Some people love to go down and they love to see the lights. It's just like 4th of July. Some people can't wait till the 4th of July. All the fireworks, they can't wait. To other people, eh, that's no big deal. Uh, Just like the Christmas lights. Some people just love the Christmas lights. To others, uh, you know, I'll see them next year. (laughs) You know, or I'll wait till I'm 70, 80, or 90. Then I'll go see them. You know, and other people, you know, boy, I, gotta, I just can't wait to see them, can't go, wait to go and see all the, uh, different. Some people put up large trees, some people put up small trees, some people put up skinny, tall trees, like out in their lobby there, you know. And, and so uh, different people decorate different ways, you know. Uh, some people would take and uh, be able to uh, buy big gifts, and some people buy small gifts and put them in big boxes. You know, and so different people do different things, all right? So we understand that here is a time that we as uh, uh, Americans have looked at a time to celebrate that which is the birth of Christ. Now, you say, well, preacher, you don't really believe that he was born December the 25th. I know some believe he's uh, born uh, in in April, and that is fine. Uh, Others believe it was a different time. But here's what I say. I just thank God that America celebrates Christmas and the birth of Christ. So it's a time collectively when we can come together and say, hey, look, this is it. We're going to celebrate it. And by the way, if we're going to celebrate, one thing about Americans, when we celebrate, we celebrate big and we celebrate right. I mean, that's one thing we know how to do in America is to celebrate. And by the way, no better way to celebrate Christmas, uh, the birthday of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you would, as he was uh, birthed, if you will, came into this world uh, as he came as the one that is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth to fulfill the mission that God, our Heavenly Father, sent him to do. What a wonderful thing. Somebody changed a, a, an old fashioned Christmas carol. They said, O little town of heartaches, how troubled we see thee lie. Uh, throughout the deep and dreamy, tossed sleep, our fears go marching by. Uh, in the dark thoughts dwelleth all the everlasting fright. The dread of tears and all the years are visiting us throughout the night. Now, by the way, that's how some people see it. It's it's a dark time. It's a time of uh, misery. I believe in Herod's life, this was a time of dread. When he heard that there was going to be born a king. When he heard that there was going to be born, yes, the king of the Jews. I believe that that frightened him. I believe that scared him. I believe that that put him in turmoil. So Herod, when Herod is looking at this, he's looking at it not the way that we look at it. As we decorate and as we have bright lights, as we celebrate and we give gifts to people that we love, Herod was looking at this from a negative side. Herod was not looking at it from positive side. He was not looking at the shepherds and saying, wow. He was not looking at the wise men and saying, wow. He was not looking with, uh, at the angels and saying, hey, I want to sing along with you. Uh, he was not looking at the, that which is God's love coming down from above, demonstrated through the giving of his only son. He was not looking at it through the eyes of one that would view the Christ child as being the Savior of the world. He had a negative slant. Now why? Let me give you what I believe Uh, was the making of a Scrooge when you view Herod. Statement number one, Herod was all wrapped up in himself, all wrapped up in himself, that nobody else mattered. He was all wrapped up in himself. And by the way, you give me somebody tonight that's all wrapped up in himself, wrapped up in herself, and nobody else matters. Can I tell you, that's the making of a Scrooge. Matthew chapter 2 and in verse 1, the Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of, uh, of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Listen to it. Behold, there, was, uh, there came wise men, it says, from the east to Jerusalem. Now watch this. 
Who do they come to? Here they're coming into Herod. The Bible says in verse 2, saying, uh, where is uh, he that is born a uh, king of the Jews? So they're coming into the territory of Herod. And they're asking around, they're inquiring, where be the king of the Jews? Where be the king of the Jews? Where be the king of the Jews? Now, can you imagine, here's an insecure fella. Here's a fella that's all wrapped up in himself. He thinks nobody else matters. He thinks that he is chief of all chiefs. And now, all of a sudden, here comes these men bearing very expensive gifts. These men are coming in and they're looking for the king. Can you imagine how that would threaten somebody that is so wrapped up in themselves? By the way, uh, Herod, I believe every time that he looked in the mirror, I think that he saw he was powerful. I think that he saw that he had prestige. I think that he saw that he had wealth. I think that he saw that he wore designer robes. I think that he recognized his own crown. I think that he saw his own uh, 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 scepter. I think that uh, he was seated in a house of royalty. I, I think that Herod knew his accomplishments. You know, in the standard world, Herod had it all. In the standard world, he was the most uh, successful king of his day. Between uh, 47 B.C. and 4 B.C., you see that uh, he built palaces. He fortified cities. He built a temple that was twice as big. Even during the times of famine, he melted down his own gold to be able to feed the people. And yet now he's very uneasy with his own crown. He's uneasy with his own crown because insanely he decides that uh, this one that is called the king of the Jews is a threat to his throne. Jesus did not come to overtake the throne of Herod. Can I remind you, please, that Jesus is not after the temporal, but he was after the eternal. Amen. He was not going to settle for that which is the kingdom that's temporal compared to the kingdom that is eternal. The things that Herod was laying hands on that gave him temporary security was in essence that which was going to give him insecurity when compared to one that was coming that was greater than he. How can you compare an eternal kingdom to a temporal kingdom? How can you compare an eternal throne to a temporal throne? How is it that you can compare uh, temporal riches to eternal riches? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. I believe this is why Herod was fearful. The Bible says, lay not up for yourself treasures upon the earth where moth doth rust and corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20 of the Bible says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. The Bible says, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. So the Bible says that here a person, and by the way, can I tell you, there's something if you would please, that gives more security about living for Christ than not living for Christ. There's a great peace knowing that you are fulfilling that which is the purpose for which God the Creator has created you to fulfill. And when you step out and fulfilling those things that God Himself has said, these are the things that you're supposed to fulfill, can I tell you, there is great peace. There's a peace that passeth all understanding. Now, by the way, uh, he had invested in the wrong treasure. Because of that, there was a temporal gain, but there was no eternal gain. Because there was no eternal gain, there was going to be problems when faced with a king that is going to be eternal. Somebody said, well, God, a million years in heaven. How long is that? He said, in heaven, a million years is only a second. He said, oh, so in heaven, what is a million dollars? God replied, in heaven, a million dollars is just a penny. He said, well, will you give me a penny? He said, in a second. <laughs> Sometimes we forget 
that that which is an eternal value is not the same as an earthly value. Sometimes we get it confused. Can I tell you, those that work in the bus ministry, I think, uh, how many, Brother Josh, were you at? 92 people working in the bus ministry. Out of the 92 people working in the bus ministry, as you go out and you knock doors and you invite people to come to church and you love people, can I tell you, for that little boy or that little girl, they don't care too much about how much you know. They don't care too much about uh, uh, if you're wearing designer clothes or mm, they don't care too much, if you will, about uh, if, uh, if you have a, 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 a nice home that you dwell in, all they know is somebody loved them. That's all they know. I remember uh, when I was at the Union City Baptist Temple and we started the bus ministry there. They had not had a bus ministry in years. And uh, when I became pastor, they, they even told me at that time, they said, you know, we don't really want you to start a, a, a bus ministry. We've not had one in years. We had a bad run with that. And so uh, we would uh, not want you to start a bus ministry. And, and uh, I, I do remember how the story went because uh, I had a friend by the name of Mike Brock. Mike is still uh, in Memphis today. He owns a scrap metal company and uh, a pretty large outfit there. And, and uh, uh, Mike would, uh, when he would come up to Union City from Memphis, Tennessee, Mike would uh, come and, and he would attend our church. And uh, Mike asked me one time, he said, would you come down and witness to the different employees I have down in Memphis? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. And so he would come up, he said, I'll hit you in the stomach with a steak or something, whatever you want. I said, I don't, you don't have to do that, but I'll be glad to come witness to your employees. And so uh, he would come up, he'd pick me up, and I'd go down and I'd witness to the guys that worked for him in the, in the scrap metal yard. And uh, several of them got saved, and we were so glad about that. Well, one day we're driving back up from Memphis, about a two-hour drive or so, and uh, he said, now, Brother Wells, he said, if you'd like to have something, what would it be that you'd like to have? Oh, I said, Brother Mike, I'd like to have a bus. I mean, I'd really like to have a bus. And, uh, and he said, really? I said, yeah, I'd like to have a bus. We don't really have a bus ministry, and I'd like to have a bus. And so uh, I said, uh, matter of fact, I'd like for you to get it, if you don't mind, and paint it. I'd like it cherry red. That way it stands out for everybody to see. And I'd like for you to put a, a, a ribbon on it and deliver it to the front yard of the church. And so we did. Oh, I had a couple of fellows who got kind of mad at me, and they said, Preacher, we didn't give you permission to spend any money out of the budget to buy a bus. I said, I didn't spend any money out of it. What do you do when God gives you a present and it's gift wrapped? What do you do with that? You know, some of those fellows rode the bus, and they watched these little boys and girls get on that bus. Can I tell you what? All of a sudden, I'm telling you the truth. Their heart began to yearn to be back in the bus ministry. And, you know, they had a meeting. They did. They had a meeting, and, and I, it was just some fellows meeting together, and they decided that they wanted to get back in the bus ministry. Oh, and can I tell you wonderful stories I could tell you about boys and girls that rode the bus, teenagers and men and women that rode the bus, Oh, I don't know where they are today. I do know there's a little girl. She's not a little girl anymore. Her name was Kamiga and still is. And uh, Kamiga uh, writes us a letter once a year. Kamiga got saved. And back then, she was about 12 or 13 or so. And she rode the bus to uh, uh, our church. And she received Christ as Savior. And once a year, she writes me a letter. And she says, Preacher, I just want to tell you how I'm doing in serving Christ. You said, was it worth that? Oh, there was many, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that received Christ uh, at that small little country church because of the bus ministry. Now, can I tell you, listen, uh, I remember one lady got saved, and, and, uh, and we led all sorts of people to Christ. I mean, we led business people to Christ. We, I mean, we just, but we had this one lady, and she was a, she was a special needs person. She's a special needs person. And, uh, and she had this four-pronged cane. And uh, we led her to Christ, and she really did get saved. She understood it, you know. She's all excited about it. And, and I told her, I said, now, look, when you get baptized, don't take that four-pronged cane into the water. You're going to hurt somebody. Well, I didn't do baptism there. You know, I, I let one of the assistant pastors do it like I do it here. And sure enough, she took that four-pronged cane into the water. Oh, that brother put her under, and she came up, whacked him in the head. <laughs> she was so excited. 
And, uh, but listen, can I tell you, you'd be amazed at the different people that God would change. That's why I'm so glad uh, we're, we now have nine routes and we run ten buses. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'm glad that we run buses to boys and girls and teenagers and men and women that otherwise would not have a way to come to church. You know what that is? That's making an eternal difference. You bus captains, don't you ever get discouraged. And you go out on Saturday, and I know you work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Then you spend half of your day out on Saturday knocking a door and uh, staying out in the heat of the summer in the cold of the winter. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes it might just seem a little bit discouraging. Hey, I'm here to tell you that you're making a difference, and people are getting saved, and lives are being changed. Hey, thank God for the bus ministry. Yeah. Uh, we have classes for young people that come in that's bus ministry classes and we teach them how to sit up in church and how to listen to the Bible and how to make Bible uh, uh, geared or Bible centered principles from the word of God and it changes their life. I'm saying this, I'm saying that Herod knew, such thing, knew, knew no such thing. Uh, Herod was all wrapped up in himself. Nobody else mattered. I don't want us to ever get so wrapped up in herself that nobody else matters. By the way, when people wrap themselves up, they make pretty small packages. It's important that you and I decide we don't get wrapped up in ourselves. Statement number two, I'm talking about the making of a Scrooge. Uh, Herod's sins had so hardened his heart that he could not respond to others. Herod's sins had uh, uh, so hardened his heart that he could not respond to others. Watch this. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 2 and verse 7. The Bible says in Herod, when he had uh, privily, the Bible says, called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Now, wait a minute. Why is he diligently calling to them? Well, here's what he says, but we know it's not true. Look at verse 8. The Bible says, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, and go search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. You know, uh, here was a man that was so hardened that he really didn't care to do that. He really didn't care to step out and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You know why? Because he was so excited about his own throne. Evidence of the fact, later on, he passed that decree that all the children, two years of age and younger, he wanted to make sure he got the Christ child. All those children, two years of age and under, would be slaughtered. Now, I'm telling you this, uh, that the, when those boys were put to slaughter, when they were killed, can I tell you uh, that there was no remorse there. There was no repentance there. There was no sorrowfulness there. Uh, here was a, a self-centered individual that was hardened in his heart. And by the way, you are hard in your heart, dear friend, if you go to hurt somebody and it doesn't bother you. If you go to hurt somebody and, and, and damage somebody and, and uh, you don't have a repentive spirit of that and, and it doesn't bring tears to your eyes and hurt to your heart to, to the point to the place where you're driven uh, to, to be heartbroken about it, can I tell you, something's wrong. We ought not enjoy hurting other people. We ought to enjoy helping other people and pouring our lives into other people and helping other people to make the right type of decision so that their lives can be helped and molded into the right direction. Somebody said, until your uh, little sins become your big sins, then your little sins will be that which is your most terrible sins. And it's true. You know, I think in our churches today, and eh, I, I just think that we're so caught up in, in our generation with things that are pulling on us. You know, and, and I'm all about it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm all about dressing up. I'm, I'm, I'm all about putting on stuff that's first class. I, I'm all about uh, 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 trying to make God look as good as he is. You cannot make him look better. That's impossible. But we can make him look as good as he is. We can try to live for him and love people and help people and encourage people. We can try to do that. Somebody said only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. And I think that's so important to understand. You know, as I get just a little bit older, I said a little bit, as I get just a little bit older, I'm finding out that, uh, you know, the things that really matter most is people, not things but people. 
You know, people that you love, uh, people that you pray for, people that are your relatives, people that are your loved ones, people that are your friends, people that you want to encourage to be able to go right. And can I tell you, as a preacher, here's where I am. I try to help people do what is right. Now, by the way, that is not an easy position to get into because the world gets worldlier. And the more that the world takes on a fleshly appearance, when a preacher gets up here and he rips hide, sometimes people get upset. Sometimes people all of a sudden say, you had no right to say that. And by the way, I've heard that. I had one gentleman stop me recently and he said, the whole service, you sat in my lap, you spit in my eye, you stomped on my feet. And then he smiled and he said, but I enjoyed every minute of it. I thought I was going to have to duck or run. Look, can I tell you this? Can I tell you that Herod's sin had so hardened his heart that he couldn't respond to others properly? Why would he do such a thing? Why would he even lie and say, well, you, you, tell, me where, you tell me where this uh, king is born? Because I myself want to go and worship. That wasn't his intent. His intent was to go and bring destruction, ruin, death. That wasn't his intent. Oh, may I say that we need true religion undefiled? May I say that in our churches and yes, in our personal lives that we ought to recognize that God is God? May I say that in our lives we ought to decide that Christ is the one that's the most important? I'm saying that Herod was wrapped up so much in himself that no one else mattered. I'm saying that Herod's sin had so hardened his heart that he couldn't respond to others properly. Let me say this, and I'm done. Herod never learned the only way to be satisfied is to live a life that gives. Amen. See, it was all about him. It was all about taking in. You know what I found out? Sometimes some people just need an encourager. Somebody that will write them a note. Somebody that will text them. Somebody that will pat them on the back when they're walking down the hallway and say, hey, look, just want to let you know, proud of you. Somebody that will be there for them to encourage them. In their darkest night or on a day that's just not as bright as yours. Sometimes we just need somebody. Hey, come on. I, I, I've had people walk in my office, and here's what they do. They would begin to cry when they walk in my office. I do have that effect on people. <laughs> and uh, they'll walk in my office, and they'll stand there at the door, and they begin to cry. I, I've had this a couple of times since I've been here. Standing at the door, they begin to cry. I say, man, what's wrong? And they'll say this, I've sinned. Well, come on in. See, Jesus sat with publicans and, yeah, sinners. And by the way, Paul said, while he was a preacher, looking back, he said, I'm chief among sinners. He never forgot who he was. I've often said this, you know, I, 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 uh, I used to be envious of people that grew up in preachers' homes. I really did. I did. I'd look at them and say, wow, wow, wow. But then I went through a change in my life. And I thought, you know, if I'm always envying that, then I'm not being thankful for what God gave me. And I tell about my dad, but can I tell you, my dad taught us character. He taught us how to work. He taught us how to keep a smile on our face when we go through difficult times. He taught us how to get in and just go and go and go with no restraint. He taught us those things. Now, can I tell you, as we look at our personal lives, we need to see, are we givers, are we takers? Matthew chapter 2 and verse 12, the Bible says, in being warned of God in a dream, it says that they should not return to Herod, 
They departed into their own country another way. The Bible says in verse 13, the Bible says, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the child to destroy him. See, eventually what takes place is the real you begins to rise. The real you begins to come out. Herod now is feeling threatened. Herod now is feeling like his power is being diminished. He's feeling like somebody can actually rise up as a child and eventually overtake his throne. But Herod now said, I'm gonna, I, I'll take care of it. Verse 16, chapter 2 of Matthew, the Bible says, Then Herod says, When he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. And sent forth, and he slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all in the coast thereof from two years old and under. So what did he do? He said, boy, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to get that king. I'm just going to get that king. Now, wait a minute. It ought not be that way at Christmas time. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, and, and even in this area, you can check your attitude. Well, I'll tell you what, I, you know, uh, I don't mind buying somebody that gift, and I don't mind buying somebody that gift, but that's somebody right there. Whoa, uh, they rubbed me the wrong way, and so I'm not going to do anything for them. I wonder why. Is there certain people in the church that when you walk down the hallway, you avoid them? Why? Is there certain people in the church that they bother you? By the way, if it is true, what are you doing to remedy the relationship are you reaching out to them are you trying to help them see Herod was all wrapped up in himself Herod was so hardened in his heart because of sin that he could not reach out to help others Herod was somebody uh, he never learned to be satisfied but he always wanted more and never learned to give let me give you this and I'm done Matthew chapter 2 and in verse 19, the Bible says, And when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared, unto, uh, appeared in a dream to Joseph. Now, by the way, uh, he's appearing in the dream to Joseph there in Egypt, and he's telling Joseph, now it's okay, you can go back. So uh, e even though, uh, and by the way, it can, can help you a little bit, few people remember Herod. Few people remember, if you would please, anything good if they do remember Herod about him. You're going to leave a legacy. You are. You're going to one day lie in state, and somebody's going to come by as you lie in state in a casket somewhere, and they're going to remember your legacy. Your children. You realize this, that somebody somewhere is writing something probably about you. It's probably on Facebook. <laughs> but it's writing something about you probably this very hour. You know, maybe in a diary somewhere or something like that. Man, I hope they can write nothing but good about you. I hope they can record, man, I tell you what, I remember the day when I came across his or her path. And wow, did they encourage me. Wow, did they pray for me. Wow, did they teach me a Bible truth that was just absolutely phenomenal. Wow, did they help me through that problem? Wow, did they help me through that struggle? See, we're not supposed to become someone so that we can obtain to ourselves. We're not in it for ourselves. We're supposed to be in it for others. So what do you do? You reach out and you say, okay, what can I do for that brother today? What can I do for that sister today? What can I do for that lost person today? What can I do to be able to reach out and try and help somebody and love somebody and encourage somebody? That's the way it ought to be. And you'd be surprised, I'm telling you, I'm just telling you how it is. You'd be surprised how many people need encouraging during the Christmas season. You'd just be surprised. You'd be surprised how many people you think, well, I'll tell you what, they've got it okay, you don't know that. Amen. And since you're not God and you can't look inside, maybe what you ought to do 
Let's just encourage everybody you can. Hello. I, um, I was watching the kids come in from school. And uh, different ones coming in and stuff like that. And uh, watching them as they came into the academy and giving them words of encouragement. Then uh, coming to the church and you look around for people. And, I, and that's how come I think the handshaking thing, man, I think that that is such a novel idea. I think, I think it's good for churches to have handshaking time. You say, well, I'll get somebody's germs. Oh, you got more than they do anyway. <laughs> I looked it up. You know these, you know these dryer things that they have in these, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know yeah. these. Uh, we we call it the dryer things that blows out. You know the hand towels. They say the the the, the paper towels that when you wash your hands and you take a paper towel, it gets off twenty five percent of the bacteria. That's what they said. When you put your hands underneath one of those dryers that blows out you receive 223% bacteria. Because <laughs> of all the bacteria that's up there that's blowing out on your hands. Now I know what you're going to do. You're never going to use one of those again. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, when you shake hands with people, that's a good thing. That's just a good thing. You know, uh, to be able to encourage people, to be able to motivate people, to be able to smile at somebody that might not, might not need a smile, as you think, on the outside, but deep down inside, that sure did help them a whole lot. Be able to tell somebody, man, I believe in you, love you, doing a great job. That helps people. That helps people. People need that. I cannot tell you. Sometimes when you do that to somebody, they might not receive it well because they don't know how to receive it. They don't receive it at home. They don't receive it maybe in the school they go to or the college they go to. They don't receive it uh, 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 in, in any other way. I was uh, meeting with Nosa right before the church service, and he was telling me about a job that he's got. And he, he said this about his job. I caught this. He said, I love my job. He said, get up in the morning looking forward to going to work. He said, we even shoot Nerf guns at each other. He's getting paid to shoot Nerf guns. <laughs> now, wait a minute. Watch this, if you will. You know what that is? You know, somebody is trying to help. Some, and I'm not saying go out, if you own a business, what, don't go out and buy Nerf guns for everybody. <laughs> I can see it now, all the staff guys are going to come in and, and on, on Tuesday and say, hey, preacher, you know. <laughs> but church ought to be someplace, and, and, and if it's not, and I'm done, here it is, so my last rabbit trail, but I, I've had fun with a couple of them tonight that I pet. But church ought to be a place where you can come because you want to learn the Word of God, like about Herod tonight. And I was reading that, that helped me. That helped me to be able to see, okay, now, Mike, you do a personal check on you. Are you selfish? Mike, do a personal check on you. Are you a Scrooge? Is that who you are? You know, and ask yourself, where are you at? Now, don't be this person that says, well, I tell you what, I, I'm glad he preached that tonight because that really got him. Ask God to help you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Father, help us tonight. Thank you for the word of God.